and welcome all of you. Uh, today is our fourth course on uh, in our Echo for Swallowing and Feeding. Some of you have been with us through all of these conversations, and that's amazing. Thank you for that. But we know, as we were just uh, chatting before we got started, that I'm hearing from people that they're watching these as a team and uh, discussing them together. And we know that uh, these uh, discussions and feeding in general, uh, safe safety in the schools is a team participation sport. And so we want to make sure uh, that everybody is on board. So we love that everybody is hearing the same thing. Welcome back today. I'm Deb Fitzgibbons. I'm the coordinator of RSOI, Regional and Statewide Services for Students with Orthopedic Impairment. Uh, we are in our fourth of a series of eight. Today, we're going to be talking about procedures and uh, forms uh, with Emily Homer. Uh, Emily comes to us from Louisiana. She's uh, got a bit warmer climate today, and uh, uh, we know that's on our horizon. Um, spring is coming, and so it's uplifting uh, and uplifting when we get a chance to talk about such meaningful topics. Mark your calendar for the same time on March the 17th when we get together again, and we'll be talking about building competency among our teams and uh, shared uh, development. And so we're on a good track. And you, uh, if you registered for today, you will receive 1.25 contact hour credits once we confirm attendance through um, the our system uh, through Zoom. Uh, you will receive a a survey. Let us know how we're doing. Then you will receive your certificate. And so, so Deb, you... I have a question yes. about that. So. When I tried, when I um, did it a couple weeks or a couple months ago, it registered me for all of them. So do I have to go in again or is it, I'm, I'm good. You are good to go. So if you're registered for all of them, if, if you attend, then that's what we do. As soon as we're done here, we'll go in and we'll confirm and you'll get the attendance. But if you registered for all of them, then, then you are good to go, girlfriend. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So any questions, it's not too late to register. I'll be happy to post that link. Uh, that's the key to uh, getting your certificate. So um, without further ado, I'm going to jump into these conversations because we always go up to the last minute with questions and comments. So Emily, thank you so much for hosting our conversations and welcome back and, and please share your screen, everyone. Feel free to unmute and ask questions as we go along. Absolutely. Okay, looking for my PowerPoint. Not sure where it went. Let's open up again. Okay. Okay, well, uh, Deborah, thank you so much. I don't, are you seeing that bar across the screen on top? Do you, do you see the bar on top or not? the bar for like with the participants and chat and all that are you guys seeing that on top because i'm seeing, okay. no no right. i think i can just get rid of that oops wait a minute i'm so sorry let me that's what i want okay here we go all right well i want to begin by just saying um thank you for coming today and for really caring about children being safe at school and eating safely. It's something that um, everyone that works in a public school system needs to be aware of and needs to know about. And, you know, I just recently did a little search about choking incidences in the schools and was really upset to see how many children are actually choking and dying in our schools. And that is something I think we can do something about. I know we can do something about. And so this procedure today will help you to help your children be safer at school. These are my disclosures. Um, I am getting an honorarium from this for this in-service as well as some royalties uh, from other things that I have done. 
So today we're talking about a district supported procedure and those two words district supported so, so important. Um, so we're going to say we're going to talk about what does that mean district supported procedure and how can you implement it in your school. So the first thing I want you to take a look at is like I mentioned earlier, I have um, revised the procedure and forms a little bit um to I, I i think it's better so uh, i hope you do too um and this is the flow <clears throat> of the procedure and we're going to go through the whole thing but you can see step one is the referral step two has two parts to it and it is now the school swallowing evaluation um and then we move on to the safe plan the cafeteria plan and so on so the first form and as you know that you know i really call this follow the forms because I know how important it is for us to document everything that we do in the public school system, whether it's swallowing or not, we need to document. Um, and so this procedural documentation form will give you a place to log all the things that you've done all in one place. And that kind of helps you to follow the flow of the procedure and just to be sure that you have done everything. And then if someone asks, you can pull it out and say, yes, this is when I did that. So it really helps with uh, following the procedure with fidelity. And there's one thing we know in the public schools is that um, the, the really, if you have a procedure and you don't follow it, you're putting yourself at risk for due process in that. That most of the lawsuits that come against uh, special education in the school districts is from a lack of following procedures, such as evaluation procedures, IEP procedures, and things like that. So we know how important documentation is and how important following that procedure is. So this is the first form. And as you can see, as you go through the steps of the procedure, you just write the date and in some places you'll say what happened or what you did. It's something you can type in and can very easily adapt to what you're doing. Um, so then we come to identifying swallowing and feeding needs of children in our schools. Um, there's actually four, three steps and two parts to the swallow eval that actually make up the whole of the evaluation process. And the step one and step two happen right together. And then a little later in the process is step six, which is the referral for an instrumentation. Um, so we're gonna talk through the whole process, but keep in mind that it is one comprehensive, <clears throat> excuse me, evaluation process. So step one, the referral slash screening. This is a very broad process for identifying students who potentially have concerns. And so what I mean by that is that you may pull in some children that don't actually need, need the services. You might do the screening and say, okay, no, I think this is typical, we're fine. Um, so it's meant to pull in, it's not specific, it's meant to pull in children. So it's done, can be done by any person who has experience with the child during mealtimes. So it can be the teacher, the paraprofessional, the uh, parent, the SLP, the OT. It really can be anyone in the school that observes something that is concerning to them about that child during mealtime. Um, so once we get the referral form completed and it identifies those concerns, then the swallowing and feeding team SLP or the OT talks to the referral source about the concerns and does an informal observation. Now, this is not your detailed clinical evaluation. This is just where you're going to set eyes on that child, watch him eat and say, oh, I see what you're talking about. Yes. Or that's pretty typical. He's okay. Uh, so that's the purpose of that little screening that you're doing. Um, and, and so once that is done and you've decided this child needs to move on, then the team leader will notify the other core team members. Just for a refresher, remember the core team members are the SLP, the OT, the PT, and the school nurse. Okay, so those four people need to know when a referral is going forward. See that Haley has her hand up. Haley, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Yeah. Um, are you talking about this district supported process as if I'm trying to word down my question? Because for us to do an observation in the school that I used to work at, we would have to have parent signature, we'd have to have a meeting beforehand. 
So are you suggesting that this process is different than what our school already has in place? Uh, yeah, I really would. I am. <laughs> uh, the way we, because we're talking about health and safety issue, um, it, these children have already been identified as having uh, special needs, correct? Are, are we talking about children that are already identified? Um, is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about someone new who's not in special not education? Not new to special ed, someone who okay. is already in special education. So you already have that parent permission. You already have those things. And because this is a health and safety issue, you are able to move forward with it. And of course, we're going to involve the parents. That's the next step. But before that, we have to say, okay, look, there's a concern here. And we need to take a look and, and see if we need to follow up on that. Okay. Does that answer? Now, now. It is possible that there are children that don't meet, that are not eligible for IDEA that will have this. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But right now, these children have, for the most part, been identified. But I was just about ready to talk about that, actually. So if the child is brand new to special education and they do, they're going through the multidisciplinary eligibility uh, evaluation, then of course you have to follow all those guidelines from IDEA, notifying the parents, setting up the meetings, doing it in a certain time frame. Um, and so you would want to include this as part of that multidisciplinary eligibility evaluation. So you would want to use the parent interview to identify if there's potential concerns. What we did in my district is in when the social worker took in a parent interview, there were a few questions, pretty uh, general questions about, do you have any, does your child have any feeding concerns or swallowing concerns? Have they ever been undernourished? Have they ever been too fed? And so that we, things that could red flag with that we needed to conduct this uh, actual swallowing procedure. So that's how we handled it with new students. And that's what this is talking about. So if you have not done a multidisciplinary evaluation yet, it would become part of that evaluation. Now, in some districts like mine, there is a separate team that does those evaluations and the school based team does not do them. OK, for any child, for any reason, uh, if that's the case, then you would maybe want to in the disciplinary, multidisciplinary eligibility evaluation, make a referral to the swallowing and feeding team at the school and have the school team identified. And the reason I say that is that if you have a separate team, they're not gonna have access to that cafeteria as easily. It's, it's a lot more complicated. So it's better for the school team to conduct it. I hope that's not too confusing. Many of you, if you're just getting started in your teams, are going to have children in the classrooms right now already identified with special needs, already having IEPs, but they've got a new referral for a swallowing and feeding concern. And that's where we flip it over to that school team, depending on what team model you chose. We talked about that, I think, last time, last month. Are you doing just the core team? Are you doing the school-based team or the combination? Whatever, well, whoever that team is for that school, they would be responsible for following this process. And thank you for asking a question. Feel free to ask all the way through and we'll hopefully get a good discussion going. Um, so this is what the referral form looks like. And you can see this child has uh, some uh, upper body control issues, oral motor issues, drooling, uh, food pocketing, um, choking and coughing. So you, we're looking at a child that probably has oral and pharyngeal phase dysphagia. Uh, so right from that checklist, you already have an idea of the child you're talking about. So once you have that referral and the screening done, then that moves us into step two, which is the school swallow evaluation process. And I, I changed this to more parallel with what medical um, facilities are doing. And they do, of course, a clinical swallow evaluation. So what we're doing in the schools now, I have shifted it to call it a school swallow evaluation. And um, it is the second step. And there's two forms associated with the school swallow evaluation. The first one is a parent interview and case history. Um, and then the second part of that uh, swallow evaluation is 
observations of the student, including general observations and oral motor observations, and then the swallow food trials. So we're gonna go into more detail about each of these steps. But let's begin with why do we conduct a school swallow evaluation? The purpose is of course, to identify the feeding and swallowing concerns, but we want to confirm the presence or absence of the signs and symptoms that alerted us to dysphagia. We want to determine the immediately immediate safety of that child and efficiency of their oral intake. So we want to see, is this a child that we need to really get on this quickly because he really is not safe? Um, or is it a child where it's taking them a very long time to eat, they're struggling with the food textures they have, and it's an efficiency issue that we need to address as well. Um, so the purpose of this uh, evaluation will give you some really wonderful information. It also helps to guide the hypotheses that we may have relating to what is happening physiologically in, in, the, in the dysphagia, if that's the concern. So it's, we're going to say, well, we, we feel like there's some oral motor issues, and now we're going to really observe and see exactly what's going on. And then it helps to guide the dysphagia management and safe feeding at school with the strategies that need to be used. So it really guides not only um, setting up the safe plan, but where do we go from there to help improve the child? So these are the essential components of the school swallow evaluation, parent interview, general observations. And so with your general observations, we're really wanting to take note of the child's alertness, his awareness, his posture, his equipment, his cognition. Is he able to follow directions? Is he aware of what's going on or does he need a lot of cueing for everything? So you're really looking at those general observations. You're also looking at oral motor and feeding observations, okay? So during the feeding, you're gonna be looking at how do the oral motor skills affect their eating, okay? And then finally, the swallow and food trials, which are really looking at the texture and the amount of food and things like that that we need to take a look at to establish safe eating. So the first part of the school swallow evaluation is a parent guardian interview and case history. Now I can also say, I, I do say parent guardian, but in some of our cases, some of our children are in high school and are cognitively aware. And so you would want to interview the child as well. So it would be the parent and the child's interview if they're uh, able to do that. Um, so fo following that referral, um, the team leader will contact the parents and guardians to let them know that there is a concern and that they are that you're sending home the parent interview form to gather more information. So the form provides us with medical history for this child. Remember that when we're in a school setting, the only medical history we typically get is from the parents. Uh, so it's very important to open that relationship with the parents and to you know, really get a discussion going with them. It also will provide us with information on how the child's fed at home. And does the parent have some goals for the child feeding? Are they concerned, you know? Um, it's really a chance for us to get information that we need in order to safely feed the child at school. Listen carefully to the parents and maybe restate what they tell you to confirm and make sure that you are understanding exactly what their message they're getting across. Um, I really recommend that this be conducted with uh, the SLP or the OT and the school nurse because the school nurse is able to dive into that medical information that's so inf important, then they might know what questions to ask that would really get to the core of what is happening. Um, they will also know more about the medications. You're, you're gonna get that information. You're gonna get a history of their medical uh, uh, upper respiratory infections, pneumonia, failure to thrive, tube feedings, things of that sort, as well as dental. So, uh, I have a question from Sarah. Sorry for interrupting, okay. Emily. Sarah wants to know, do we have a copy of the parental interview form? Is that in the folder? 
and that's what I, I have revised these forms. So I did not give Deborah all those forms. I thought it was maybe too many for this course. But I after this session, I'm going to be giving her the narrative of, of the procedure and all of the forms. So any form that I refer to today, I am going to give to Deborah to give to you. And the way this works is that you can use those forms in your district, you can put your school district's logo and address and everything on it. You can even modify or edit the forms to meet your needs and your district. These were forms that were, well, at this point, a lot of these forms are mine, but they originally were uh, established in uh, the public school system. And that's how I look at it, that they are for the public. So you will definitely be getting those. And, and thank you for that. And, and I know that, it, and I'll say this just about every time we meet, is that as people look at, at across our state and uh, the different models of support, uh, some folks are very new to uh, feeding teams. And, and these documents are really good guiding documents, but they're also templates uh, that may be something that needs to be maybe modified a bit in your area. Uh, and that could happen. Um, you know, the way we felt about it is, you know, we really learned so much through this process of, of getting this team procedure going. And we hate for anyone else to have to learn the hard way when we've learned it. So we're giving you the information. This has been used for 20, so almost 25 years now, which is super hard to believe. So we know that the procedure is effective. And, and so I'm happy to share this stuff with you. With and if there are things that you have questions about, again, your voices are so important here yeah. uh, to let us know how we can best support you. Uh, and one of the things we found is that, that is the best is bringing, uh, bringing it to conversation and discussion. So thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Okay, so some of the other things that you're gonna learn when you interview that parent, and I really recommend face-to-face -face interview or a virtual interview or even a phone call, but we know this is the public schools. In some cases, you're lucky to get the form back, you know, and that will happen. You may have to operate without this form, which would be very difficult, but we try our best to get what we need. Uh, and so ideally we would interview the parents. And so they're gonna tell us, how's that child eating at home? What are the foods they eat? How does mom prepare the foods? You know, Is he able to eat by himself? Does he enjoy his meal time? How does he indicate hunger, uh, fullness? You know, Is he eating all day long? Are they, is he eating with the family? All of this information is going to help you to zero in on what needs to be done for at school, which may be different. And that's something you have to be willing to talk to parents about because our setting is different, because a cafeteria is very different from a home table, because a mom giving the child food is very different from different paraprofessionals feeding the child. So it may be different. Um, so you need to approach this interview with the parents as an opportunity to learn more about that child. Understand that with parents, feeding their child is one of the most important things they do, and it can get very emotional. Any of you who have had a picky eater, you know how emotional eating can be when a child is picky or refuses to eat. So providing their child with nutrition is probably the most nurturing thing a parent does. So we have to be very gentle and careful with them and not insinuate that they're not doing it right and we know how to do it right or, you know, but, but more that we need your information so that we can really put a safe plan together, together for your child and that it may be different than how they eat at home. So it's really a time to gather information. Um, I love this quote by Angel and Associates. It says, working with students who have dysphagia can certainly be difficult, but understanding the family's perspectives can prove not only helpful, but in many instances, crucial to developing and implementing effective programming. When we do not have that good relationship with the parents, when we're not being considerate of their perspective, it can often go really bad. And then you have a struggle on your hands to really establish that safe plan. So this is a page out of your um, uh, 
it's a, I think it's a three page form for the parent interview. You can see it talks about uh, bowel habits, allergies, medication, uh, a little bit of history about what tests they've had, uh, things of that sort. So it's essential to involve the parents from the very beginning. And I'm telling you, when I talk about learning from experience, this was one of those things we learned. You have to get the parents involved from the beginning. It's their child to listen to them and provide them with information about dysphagia. They may not know much about it. Inform them of the of the inform them that your district is using a team procedure throughout the district, that it's not just for their child, that this is what you do for children who have these signs of swallowing and feeding. Sometimes parents will feel like we're sectioning their child out or picking on them. So the fact that there is, is being done throughout the district is very helpful for them to know. And it's also helpful for them to know that we're not trying to make it easier for the paraprofessionals to feed the child, that we're not, um, you know, there is no alternative motive. The, the goal of the team is safe and efficient eating at school for their child. Rapport with the family, the parents and the family will equal better outcomes for, your, for the child at school. So it's very, very important. So now we're gonna shift on to the interdisciplinary part of the school swallowing uh, uh, evaluation. And that is the food trials, the swallow and food trial part. <clears throat> Prior to beginning that, you want to talk to the food service authorities about maybe preparing some textures ahead of time that should you need to sample a different texture than that child is currently eating, you would have it available to you. So if this child is eating your typical chopped diet, you might talk to the cafeteria about providing a soft and bite-sized or a minced and moist diet, even a puree, in case you need it. Just some food samples of that so that you really can try the textures you need. In addition, you wanna to talk to the paraprofessional who is responsible for feeding that child and tell them what's gonna happen. Let them know that you're, they're going to begin by feeding the child in the way that they have been doing it yesterday, the day before, and the way they're used to feeding the child. And, but that once you see something that may be a concern, you may ask them to do something different. So that you may ask them to try mashing the food. You may ask them to try adding a little liquid to it and stirring it up. So there's things you may ask the feeder to do. And then you may say, well, we have this other texture I want you to try. So they need to be aware that they may be asked to try some different things during the meal. You also want to notify the physical therapist before conducting the school swallow evaluation. Ask them to observe the student's current feeding position and determine if they're having any trouble with postural stability. So leaning to the side, keeping their head upright, are they lying down or reclined, eating with their neck in extension. Um, then the physical therapist can do positioning recommendations, including any equipment such as a back brace or head support that may be needed so that when you go to do that school swallowing evaluation, that child is in a good posture for eating and ready to go. Sarah uh, uh, posted in the chat. Sarah, do you want to say anything more about the great new services uh, that you provide in your area? No, we just, we've been working on establishing a better relationship with nutrition services and um, the lead of nutrition services has been really receptive to what our team does and, um, you know, some of the mandates <laughs> required for our students to be able to eat. And, um, you know, it's not in every school that we have success, but in many of our schools, they're willing to prepare the food or provide alternates or even extra condiments for our classrooms. Um, with students who all require, you know, a little bit more help to get that bowl as cohesive. So um, I would say if you're not having success, just to keep trying. That's a wonderful thing to say. And, and I can tell you, we, we really uh, underestimated the food service program when we were getting going on this. And we were like, oh, the speed, you know, we have to do the texture modification. We have to 
But the reality is that they will take that on. That is what they're supposed to do. They do have regulations that require it. And I, I think they take it very seriously in most cases. So I appreciate you saying that. And you're right. It, at first, they may be a little bit unsure and it may take some training and some work with them. But I think you can get to the point where you can say, I need a, a minced and moist uh, tray. And they have a list of what mist and moist trays look like and they give it to, you, to the child, so, which is a great place to be. Thank you for sharing that. So the other thing you wanna do is you wanna determine the best location in the cafeteria or classroom that is most conducive for conducting the observation, but it's still close to the typical eating uh, situation that the child is used to. So if it's in the big cafeteria and that child usually sits in the middle, that's gonna be really hard. You know, those tables are long, hundreds of kids. It's hard to observe them in the middle. They may have to move to the edge of the table. Uh, so work that out ahead of time so that when you go in, you can really set that child up where he needs to be without too much ruckus and disrupting his normal schedule. You also want to consider the information that you have already collected through your referral and your parent interview. First of you, all you know the concerns that were really a red flag. So you've got that in your mind. And then all that information we talked about with the parent interview, you've got that. Where are there any esophageal concerns or you know, the typical family thing, the parents' concerns and all of that that's all that information goes into establishing that safe eating plan. So you're going to consider all of that when you're doing your school swallow evaluation, food trials, and there may be things you pull from that during that evaluation. Um, so during the swallow food trials, we're really trying to, uh, first of all, observe the child where they are right now what is their typical meal at school and what does that look like when they eat? Um, so the purpose of this feeding observation is to assess how the child's motor, sensory and cognitive skills as where, well as that physical environment that's so important impact feeding and swallowing. So that's why we're doing this. The more signs indicated on the referral, result in a greater risk for the student. So, you know, the one that I showed you, they had some significant concerns there. So that would be, uh, you, you want to be sure you address those concerns. So now we're gonna talk, remember I talked about the observations about the alertness, the awareness, the independence, the communication skills during meal times, all of those observations you're making, but you also need to look at the child's oral motor skills, okay? Um, I'm not, I'm not um, suggesting that you have to do a full blown oral motor evaluation. We're really looking for oral motor skills as they relate to eating. So you're gonna to wanna to try to notice, does that child have tongue lateralization when he's eating? Is the tongue moving from side to side or is it just pumping up and down? Is there tongue elevation? What about lip closure? If they have a lot of spillage, a lot of food coming out, they clearly have difficulty with lip closure. You're gonna see it, you're gonna observe it and you're gonna mark it on the form. Rotary chewing, it should be moving side to side to form a good bolus, but also how many times does the child chew a bit of food? If it's taking him a very long time to chew the food that is presented to him, it may be too difficult of a texture for them at that point. Uh, are they chewing once or twice and then swallowing, not breaking down that food into a good bolus? These are things you're going to see once you start observing that child. And so you're observing the food trials, but you're also observing those oral motor skills that are so important. Uh, does this child hesitate to swallow? Does they chew and chew and leave it in their mouth? Uh, you're going to look at oral tone. Is there drooping, drooling? Is the tongue position low and forward? Uh, open mouth posture, flaccid, not toned cheeks, food loss, things like that. And then you want to know, is that child swallowing everything? Uh, have the child open their mouth to see, are there food particles in the oral cavity or on the tongue? And if so, can the child do a lingual sweep to collect that leftover food and swallow it? Do they have any awareness of food in their mouth or on their lip or tongue or cheek or palate? 
are they sensitive enough to feel that? Are they so low sensitivity that they don't even know it's there? Does the child swallow on their own or do they kind of wait to be cued? Uh, what is the oral resting position? The tongue should be making contact with either the bottom or top teeth, but retracted inside the oral cavity with the tongue tip resting on the alveolar ridge. The jaw should be maintained in a high, but not completely closed position. You want to watch the student drink from a straw if they're able to, look for lip closure, cheek tension, tongue retraction, spillage, and things like that. You also want to see if there's a tongue thrust. So all of this great information for uh, oral, looking at their oral mechanism during a, a feeding, a swallow and food trials. Uh, I got through the ARC therapeutics. And if you, I, so I put that reference on the bottom of this because there's a lot more detailed information that will help you to really understand where this all fits in looking at uh, the child's eating at school. So I encourage you to look at that site. Um, so oral motor skills are observed at the same time. So it doesn't have to be a separate evaluation. Um, the observations are recorded and will help to direct you in writing your plan. So for example, if you observe poor head control, then you would get back to the physical therapist and ask them to take a look at that. If the child needs assistance eating, how much assistance do they need? So you would react to that. Is it a one-on-one -on -one feeder to child or is, can one uh, feeder observe two children at a time or monitor two children? Is there lip closure? If you don't see lip closure, then that child may need two or three point support to keep their mouth closed while they're chewing. Um, it, and some of our CP kids will need that. If there's difficulty chewing, the student may be a good candidate for oral motor therapy. Um, so you can see how the things you observe during this oral motor evaluation during the swallowing and food trials will help guide you not only in writing the safe plan, but therapeutically as well. So the swallowing food trials in particular identified the need for texture or liquid modifications, adapted feeding tools, and other positioning changes. And it provides the information we need for the plan. It also may identify a need for medical intervention. So for example, it, during the observation of the student, you may notice that he's belching and in pain when trying to swallow food. And um, so you may need to then talk to the parents about the possibility of some esophageal issues going on. This would not be something the school district would have to pay for. You can discuss this with the parents that you observe these signs and that they might wanna to talk to the doctor about that. So you can see where ob your observations may lead to that child getting some help that they need. So just a note, about the swallowing and uh, swallow food trials, it's going to be logistically difficult because it's in a school cafeteria. And we've all been in school cafeterias and we know how they are uh, pretty chaotic. They're noisy. The children do not have much time to eat. There's a lot of motion going on. So it's going to be difficult to conduct a school swallow evaluation in that setting. But you want to try hard to get as close as possible to the typical mealtime at school to observe them in the setting they're most familiar with. And if possible, conduct it as a team. But you know, you may need to break it down. You may have uh, the SLP observing food textures one time and OT coming and looking at sensory and utensils another time. It just depends. Ideally, yes, you do it together, um, but it may not be possible. Uh, we're very flexible in the schools. We know that things often do not come easy and we are not able to do them the way best practices might recommend. Uh, and then you also want to work with your cafeteria, as we already mentioned, about uh, getting food ready. So, like I said, you're starting where the child is. So you take the child's typical tray at school and it can be the tray, uh, it can be the school tray or it can be the lunch from home. And you observe them eating that food. As soon as you see something that is a concern, and you may not, the, the food they're eating at from home or in the cafeteria may be appropriate. You know, that's very possible. But if you observe something that is a concern, 
gurgly voice, eyes watering, maybe inadequate chewing, spillage, things like that, then you start to modify the meal to determine the safest way to feed that child. When it comes to liquids, if the child has any signs of aspiration on liquids, you're going to want to do some therapeutic trials of a slightly thicker uh, liquid. Um, you want to go into the, the increment steps from IDSI. Um, so you would go from thin liquid to mildly thick and then to moderately thick. And when you see the signs improve to the point that the you no longer are observing the gurgly voice or the coughing or the watering eyes, well, then that would be the, the thickness you would recommend on that child's plan. You also want to then talk to the parents and if possible, the physician to tell them that, you know, I had to move him to a more restricted, uh, a, a more uh, modified liquid, which is it, it could be indicative of aspiration. So you're going to uh, uh, recommend an instrumental evaluation and that the parents might wanna talk to the physician. Uh, in the meantime, your school nurse can periodically listen to the lungs, which is auscultation and listen for crackling sounds indicating aspiration. Just a real note about that, that has, was very helpful for us at certain times. We would hear the crackling, we'd stop and make the immediate referral um, for the modified barium swallow study. But if the nurse listens to the lungs and does not hear the crackling, it does not necessarily mean that that child is not aspirating. So you have to keep in mind because the lungs have so much space they may not be hitting the right spot or hearing it. If they hear it, definitely. If not, you still may want to pursue a swallow study. And so you would continue to use the recommended thickness that you observed in your uh, swallow food trials until the modified, uh, until you're able to get the modified uh, barium swallow study completed. But consider that the measure, measure of success of a diet modification or a treatment plan should not be based on the outcome of a modified bear and swallow study, but more on functional change. So you're gonna look at decreased and eliminated signs of aspiration, an increase in weight gain, decreased aversion, and improved respiratory health. All of these things tell us that what you're doing in this swallow plan is working, it's helping. Okay, so some of the other things that you're going to want to observe during the school swallow evaluation. And what I did with this is I, I really had a lot more detail uh, that I wanted to share with you on this, but because we do typically run short of time in these, I provided that additional information as a handout. Um, so I'm gonna cover these topics, but there's a little more information in your handout. So of course, we've talked about positioning a lot already. Sensory concerns, you know, we wanna identify, does that child have any sensitivities to temperature, texture, taste, color, things like that? Because that would be something you would want to address in the plan. Uh, special utensils, cups, bowls, things of that sort. Oral presentation concerns to determine lateral or midline uh, placement, pacing, like is the child able to swallow then take another bite or does he have to be held back from taking another bite until he swallows, cueing and things of that sort. And then of course the food modifications, the food textures of the liquid thickness that would need to be uh, uh, recommended. Okay, I'm hearing somebody's mics open. Okay, so this is a sample of the um, school swallow evaluation uh, form. And you can see that it really is very detailed in not only the oral motor, but in what are the uh, signs of airway invasion that you may be seeing. Um, the, you know, and, and what are the strategies you attempted and were they successful? So hopefully you'll like this new form. Please let me know um, because I, I feel like getting closer to a better, better form. All right, so that finishes the school swallow evaluation. Does anyone have any questions or comments before we move on to establishing the safe eating plan? 
Um, Emily, I have a, a question um, as far as um, the use of uh, any kind of like a thickener for, you know, like I have, I have a student that um, just recently, um, she wasn't really drinking very much uh, for a little bit, but she, I found that she is uh, coughing on any type of cup that we use with her. So I really suspect that she just cannot handle um, thin liquids. And when I worked in the hospital setting, like we could not add a thickener or anything like that without consent from the physician. But mm -hmm. I'm hearing you say that you are using thickeners in school without consent. I mean, are you concerned about, um, I mean, I guess you're getting parent consent for uh, that, but. What we're, what we're doing is, um, and, and you know, you bring up a really good point there, but, um, we would not be able to give that child anything to drink if we weren't able to thicken the liquid. So it becomes a safety issue for that child. Um, and the schools have total responsibility for student safety while they're on the campus. Um, so that's where that comes from. And, and, and Asha does say that we do not need a physician script for the identification or the treatment of a swallowing and feeding problem in the school setting. Um, so, I, and and I so I feel very uh, secure in that statement. However, because you're looking at something that maybe indicates some physiological issue or a structural issue, then we do recommend referring for a modified barium swallowing, working with the parents to get that referral and um, getting that done so that we can really see what's going on forensically. So we don't take it lightly but we do get that child safe at school in the meantime until we get more information. So look at it as, okay, we're gonna get this child as safe as we can. We're gonna refer them to the school. And, and hopefully the parents will uh, cooperate with the referral. If the parents don't, sometimes parents will not let us talk to physicians. They will not uh, listen to our concerns. And in which case we still have to either we have to feed that child safely or they can't be at school, okay? So we would not want a child to go all day without drinking anything. So the option is to provide as safe uh, liquid modification as we can to, uh, for that child. Uh, how does that sit with you? Um, so in this situation, I mean, I suspect that because I've talked to the family about the uh, with the drinking and, and they're, they don't note any concerns at home, you know, and it's a little bit, I think of a cultural, um, mm -hmm. issue. And I suspect that they're not going to be willing to take her for a swallow study. I just think that they think there's not a problem there. They don't see yeah. that there is. So I, and I do not think that she is safe drinking at school. Um, and she's, I mean, she's on modified for her food too. And the family understands that, that piece of it. And they are, supporting that piece. So I'm, yeah, I think we're going to be in a bind because I, I, I mean, the family though might, they might be okay with us using a thickener um, at school. Um, I don't think that they'll do any further testing. What signs do you see of, uh, as, that makes you concerned about the thin liquid? Um, well, she's just coughing with any type of sippy cup that we use. And I've tried a nosy cup with her and she, um, she has Down syndrome. So you see some uh, tongue threats. It's, it's like, she's just blocking the liquid. She just yeah. cannot control the liquid and, and in her mouth. And she low, has spillage. You tried a low flow cup as well. That, um, sometimes that helps, but, but the thing is, so sometimes it really helps. And I, I don't know about this parent cause they're all different um, to bring the parent in and have, you know, have, go, go through the meal with them and say, notice every time she drinks, she um, coughs. And then if you can, you know, there's a lot of these little videos that kind of a animated video that shows what happens when the food goes uh, the wrong way, so to speak. And you can kind of do a little education session with the parent and say, you know, it's not, it's not something we can't deal with. Watch when I give her a little thicker liquid, what happens? And you know you can see now she's drinking, but she's not coughing. So I, sometimes that really helps, and I, I know that's you know a huge time commitment for us in the schools to do that. But sometimes with some parents, it really does take them coming and observing, and us really telling them you know it 
training them, teaching them about what's going on. And, you know, the, the research I saw uh, when I'm working on my book is that when we educate parents, they feel less stressful, they feel more relaxed with their child. So I, I really highly recommend that. And I know that we always have parents who join us in our sessions and we love that, but I think that they would all be shaking uh, their head, nodding their head in agreement on that. I hope so. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to step three, which is establishing a safe eating plan and training. Okay, so, so following the school swallow evaluation, the core team gets together and takes all this tons of information you've accumulated with each person contributing their expertise and they write a very clear and easy to read safe swallow plan. Um, and this plan provides the classroom staff and the feeders with the information they need to safely feed the child at school. It needs to be put in a location in the classroom that can be easily accessed and referred to when need to, because even though your classroom staff is well trained, they may say, you know, I can't really remember what she said about this and need to go back and read it again and check on it. So you can't put it in public view because that's a privacy issue, but keep it in a folder, usually with the emergency plan and the health plan all together. Uh, it, it will need to be updated and modified as the student skills change. We're working with children who are growing and changing all the time. So it's something that will need to be changed and, and not on any set schedule. Uh, but definitely at the beginning of each school year, it's going to need to be looked at and modified if needed. Children can change an awful lot during the summer. Emily, I have a, a question that was messaged to me. Uh, do you recommend taking videos to a company um, to, to demonstrate and to share um, with you other know, I, team I have, members? I have recommended a video in the past. I think we have to be so careful with getting permission to video someone's child, and be, especially a special needs child. So that's my hesitation with videos, is that as long as you have that good documentation that the parents are okay with it, then you can video them. And if you're videoing it for the parents, you still would need that permission. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the safe eating plan it includes identifying information, a brief history, what was that initial concern, recommendations, positioning equipment, diet food prep, feeding plan techniques and precautions such as how big should the bolus size be? How much monitoring does that child need? And then at the bottom of the form that I use, we have a place of a verification of classroom staff. And this is one of those things we also learn the hard way. Once you feel that a staff member in the classroom is ready to feed that child, they need to sign and date that they've been trained. And that way, they are accountable for what they're doing. And we found that when we didn't do that, we would come back and sometimes they say, well, I didn't know, or I've never really been trained right or whatever. So we felt this was important. Some districts do not care for doing this. So you may want to take that out. It just depends. Um, however, you always have to have a sufficient number of feeders trained. So it's, it's good to have that verification. Other school districts, use the training technique that they, when they train uh, classroom staff on seizure reactions or tube feedings, they, whatever they, however they do that, they would do for this as well. So do whatever works in your district, but I think it's good to have some record of the training. And of course, this is the swallow plan. So all those things we looked at in the school swallow eval are things you're putting on that plan, the sensory concerns, the utensils, the spoon placement, cup drinking, compensations, everything, it all goes in that plan, but in a bulleted, easy to read, easy to reference format. Then you have to, then the next step is to decide what kind of training does that child need? Do they need um, texture modification? Do they need positioning? And then whoever, whatever team member is responsible for that needs to be notified. Also need to determine the amount of monitoring to match with their skills, okay? So we talked about that already a little bit, one-on-one, two-on-one, even three-on-one for some mild cases. 
So once a safe plan is established, the core team then trains the classroom staff. So you want to train at least three feeders, including the classroom teacher. Now, this is just a, a common division of the training. You may do it differently. Um, SLPs will do the food and liquid modifications, including special precautions and considerations. The OTs often do the adaptive feeding equipment and sensory considerations. PT positioning for eating, and nurses do the emergency plan and the individualized health plan, recognizing and reporting undernutrition and dehydration. I also suggest that the school nurses train the classroom staff on undernutrition and dehydration and recognizing it. Um, so when you're training feeders, you want, first of all, for them to become familiar with the actual plan itself. Then you're going to demonstrate feeding the student according to the plan so that they know what it looks like. Then once they kind of understand what they're supposed to do, you will observe them eating several times, feeding the child several times, making sure that they're uh, understanding. And they'll want to practice. They can practice with the student or they can practice with, um, the, with each other. This is a form I put together for the classroom teacher so that she can keep track of all the children in her class that need supervision during mealtimes and who the trained feeders are. And it, so you can see it, it does say the level. So I, I think it's a helpful form. Uh, and now we're gonna move on. I'm, I always seem to start running out of time. Uh, classroom procedure, uh, we talked a little bit about that. We know that USDA food service program is federally funded. It has regulations. It requires that substitutions and modifications in meals for children who are considered disabled uh, or whose disability restrict their diet must be provided. So there's really no discussion there. The food service program is responsible. So what you need to do, they have two avenues. They have a meal modification form that needs to be signed by a physician saying that that child uh, needs, uh, they cannot eat the typical tray and needs modifications made. Or you can put the information on the child's IEP when they have an IEP and that will be sufficient where they will not need the physician's signature on that. Um, so that's really important because they did that so the school districts, it would save them time and, and difficulty. Um, the purpose of this is twofold. One is that the food tray remains nutritious and equal in nutrition to the other students. The other is to get funding for that modified tray. So this is, we adapted the prescription that our cafeteria program is using and added the uh, consistencies that would need to be. Uh, so if, if your cafeteria depends, decides to use a form, you might need to modify it. So what are the things that must be put on the IEP in order for that diet to be modified? An explanation of what must be done to accommodate the child and the food or foods that need to be omitted and you can recommend alternatives if possible. By putting that on, on the IEP, you can then um, proceed with modifying that tray, okay? So you're gonna need to, when, now when parents bring, when the child brings the food from home, you're probably gonna have to work with those parents on understanding the recommended diet. They're not gonna know what minced and moist means, for example, or how to get that texture. They're gonna need to know what foods to include. They may want the classroom staff to modify the food so they bring it and you make it minced and moist, or they may learn to do it and, and send the food that way. The important thing to know is that once that plan is written, whether the parents provide the correct food or not, the school district has to feed the child a safe diet. So they have to work with those parents to get the proper foods. A lot of times parents will not send foods that we can use. Um, and so that can be an issue. And that's why it's good to have a district supported procedure where you can go to your supervisors if there's a problem with that. Uh, Emily, I have mentioned it before uh, about how a good number of our folks are working in early childhood, early intervention. And we realize some of these topics are um, a, a little bit different whenever we look at that um, environment. And just just recognizing that, so I'm not sure exactly what the differences are, but I'm, 
um, just noting that K-12 is going to be uh, different when, than our early settings because we have so, com so many community organizations that are filling this role because yeah. it's outside of the school system. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Of course, the zero to three population, they get their services at home. So they're, they're good with the, they train the parents. And then the three to five, uh, you're right, could be a different setting. And, and you'd have to work with that individual setting. Yeah. Uh, so next is the IEP conference. It's set up by the classroom teacher, should include all the key personnel. It accomplishes a lot of things. Uh, we, we document the medical information. We may get additional medical information. Hopefully you'll get your release of information form signed. You'll discuss the safe eating plan, the individualized health plan, and the emergency plans with the parents and the teachers. And you'll talk about a referral if, uh, for an instrumental evaluation if that's needed. On the general student information, you're gonna put a description of the student's disorder, the medical history, let them know that they he are being followed by the team, the diet recommendation, those information you need for food service, indicate whether you're planning a referral for a modified. And uh, all this can be put in the health needs section of the IEP. Uh, some children will get therapy and that would go on the program service page. Typically, I, I think uh, it would go under speech and language if it's a speech pathologist and self-help goals if it's the OT. Um, if the child does not qualify for speech and language or OT, then those services would go under health services. Developing feeding goals should begin with a student will, and they must be measurable. Um, oral go motor goals and improve functional feeding skill and progression to different foods and textures and so on. So it's a very practical, functional, self-help type thing. So you can address things like lip closure, lingual mobility, tongue lateralization, strengthening the jaw, and things of that sort. So the IEP really discusses everything that has happened so far. Everyone is there. The parents know everything and hear it all. You talk about that instrumental eval. And you can also set up a time to train the parents on how to do the safe plan that they might want to use at home as well. Step six is the referral for the modified barium swallow study. Um, not every child will need this. Um, uh, for uh, many cases, our oral phase or oral sen our behavioral sensory uh, disorders, but there are, you know, all children should be considered, do they need it? Uh, especially if there's pharyngeal functioning or pulmonary health or issues. So when do you refer? When there are clear signs, like we talked about, the gurgly voice, the coughing, when they need to have liquids thickened, indicates a pharyngeal involvement. A concern about aspiration without the signs. Um, when there's a history of aspiration, if a child came to us with a history of aspiration, we'd want to check that out, and make sure they're clear to eat a regular diet. Or when the student appears to be undernourished, lethargic, has chest pain, coughing, phlegm, is eating, but there's really a question about their intake and, and efficiency. The instrumental assessment may be used to examine the anatomy and physiology of the oral cavity and the pharynx during swallowing. It will give us more information about the oral and pharyngeal and esophageal phases to help us guide in our diagnosis and in our therapeutic intervention. And we'll and can uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the strategies we're recommending for safe eating. So um, I'm gonna let you go over this because we're running out of time, but it's just steps that you would need to um, set up a modified barium swallow study. So what you wanna do when you have, um, when you're referring for the model, you wanna form a hypothesis of what do you think is happening with the child and what information do you hope to get from the study? What is the setup at the hospital? Can that hospital accommodate a wheelchair? You need to know this ahead of time because if they cannot, some of our really involved cerebral palsy kids cannot be put on those chairs and you'd have to find a different hospital. Are there positioning concerns and obstacles? You want to know all that before you get to the hospital. And what do you need to do to prepare the student and the family? Will they be bringing utensils and foods or 
should you bring the utensils uh, and, and make sure that the hospital has the foods you want to uh, evaluate? And will the school-based person be attending? This is the form that we use to inform the hospital of uh, the referral. And we, I always feel the team leader should go because they can assist in getting uh, the study that the school district needs because parents don't always have the same concerns that we do. And the, if we're not there, they will follow the concerns of the parents. And it gives us a much better picture of the student swallowing, which can be helpful in writing our plan. Once that is done, then the revision of the safe plan based on the information that you have gathered. So if it told you some strategies are not effective, then you'll wanna use the ones that did appear to be. And also the aspiration risk, you wanna uh, follow what those recommendations said. Um, then the staff will have to be uh, retrained on the new plan um, and um, the parents are notified that you're making those changes. The last step is ongoing monitoring consultation. All children must be monitored on an ongoing basis to make sure that the plan continues to be safe and appropriate. In addition, some children will need oral motor or sensory motor therapy to really improve their skills, their children. Um, so the ongoing monitoring and consultation ensures that the plan continues to be appropriate, that the feeders are implementing the plan as it's written, and that the food textures are being modified correctly. And this way we know that that safety is being maintained. In addition, you can train classroom staff to recognize changes, and you'll be aware when their changes are occurring. You can answer questions and concerns on a regular basis as they occur, and um, it, the safety is maintained. Therapy is important because some of our children really can benefit from it, from improving their chewing skills. And if we can move those children to more normalized eating, it's very important. Remember, eating is a self-help skill. And so it's important that we do that. So these are the building blocks. This is the identification process we've talked about today. These are establishing a safe plan and maintaining it that we've talked about. There is a section on management of swallowing and feeding throughout the school year that I am not going to talk about today. I put that in your handouts, just have to read it. It's, it's not rocket science. It'll make a lot of sense to you. Now we're going to get to our case study, which I think we have time for. And I hope to get some comments on this, okay? Um, this is about a 15-year-old special needs student who is hearing impaired, nonverbal, visually impaired, is also severely cognitively impaired, and has a heart condition. The school reportedly was starting to regurgitate food. So the school uh, referred him uh, and they, the swallowing uh, team went in and did a school swallowing evaluation. They identified that he needed, he could eat finger foods independence, independently and spoon fork uh, foods with assistance. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. These are the things they, they observed him doing finger fooding independently and um, spoon fork with assistance. They, he was overstuffing with no self-monitoring as to the amount of food in his mouth. He was eating very quickly, did not swallow before adding food to his mouth, had weak chewing skills with poor bolus formation and swallowed without adequate chewing and some regurgitation. So the team decided that this child needed one-on-one -on -one monitoring during all meals, snacks, and foods during school when, when he's there, okay? Upright position with his feet firmly supported, ongoing monitoring of the student's plan, soft and bite-sized diet modification due to a lack of chewing skills, cue to swallow. Once the bowl, bowl is swallowed, then the student is presented with another bite. So the student does not really self-feed. The paraprofessional feeding him holds back the food until he has swallowed, and then he's given another bite. And due to his visual and auditory impairments, the students will be cued by touch and hand uh, guidance. So to implement this plan, two paraprofessionals were trained as well as a classroom teacher on how to cue the child and how to monitor. Uh, the students' plans were part of the sub, were added to the substitute student, the student substitute folder 
uh, that uh, so that any substitute that was in that class would be aware of it. And there was a backup plan that if all the feeders were absent, that the SLP or the OT would then help to feed that child. The cafeteria was notified of the student's diet recommendation of soft and bite size. And I call this procedure matters because this was actually an actual student whose school district did not have a plan in place. So none of the things that I just talked about happened. None of those uh, recommendations were made. The plan was not written. The, but they did write on the IEP that the child needed to be closely and carefully supervised while eating and to prevent him from eating too fast and swallowing without chewing and also required that his food had to be in bite-sized pieces. The IEP also recognized that a lack of close supervision and monitoring of the student while eating presented a serious risk of choking. On the, this particular day, both the teacher and the paraprofessional who knew how to feed the child were absent. Remember, there was no safe eating plan uh, for that child. And so the substitute couldn't review it. And uh, he went by the substitute folder, which did not really have the detailed IEP in it. Therefore, the child was given a breakfast tray with pancakes. He fed himself with the substitute was there, but didn't realize that he was supposed to be limiting the amount of food the child was given um, because he was just not aware of those recommendations. As a result, and this is the reference to this case, if you want to look it up, as a result, procedure matters, he ate too fast, swallowing his food without chewing, and his food was not cut into bite-sized pieces. According to the EMS paramedic that uh, came to the school, there was a large amount of food, some of which consisted of big chunks and was unchewed. It was sanctioned from the student's airway. The second EMS paramedic testified in court that chunks of food entered the suction tube, but some of the food was too big to come up the tube. And the paramedics were unable to intimate the student because there was so much food in him. So the facts at trial clearly showed that the student, a 15 year old with many student special needs, choked while eating breakfast, which led to cardiac arrest and his death. And that's why I say, uh, procedure matters. Uh, this very well could have been avoided. And these things are happening in our schools uh, around the country. And so I, I'm so glad you're here listening to this. And I'm so glad that we had a chance to talk about these procedures. And I will get that information to Deborah. And I'm just wondering if anyone has any questions or comments. Kind of a heavy way to end it, I know. I'm very sorry about that. Well, it's a dose of reality. And um, you know, you brought tears to my eyes to think about in that comment that you made that it could have been prevented. That's why it, we are having these conversations right now. Well, it is so I, I important. think if you, if you Google uh, choking deaths in school and you read about these cases, just read it with a mind, well, would it have made a difference if we had a procedure? And, I think and Mary Ellen wanted to know, did you say that you have case references? That's in the slides, right? Yes, it's in the to slides. Find this, okay. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can read the whole, they, they appealed, the school district appealed and lost the appeal as well. So is that it? Any other questions?